Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this new message. I hope and pray that you are all well and free from this coronavirus. But anyway, within the lockdown, let's come together and commit this meeting to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for your word. Your word is truth, absolute truth, unshakable truth. And I pray today, Heavenly Father, that you would grant this imperfect vessel the ability to, to bring your word to your flock. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brethren, turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 27 once again. Psalm 27, this will be the second in this series on this psalm. And we'll read it through once again, all through. Psalm 27, verse 1. <coughs> Psalm of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I will seek after, sorry, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. <clears throat> Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me <coughs> in a plain path because of mine enemies. <coughs> Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and as such breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word to us this day. <coughs> Please excuse me, clearing my throat over a slight touch of hay fever this morning. <coughs> so please forgive the croakiness at times and the clearing of my throat. <coughs> now in the last message, or part one I should say, we looked at the first three verses of this marvellous Psalm of David. Now I truly hope that you were, as I was, both challenged and encouraged by these words that he was inspired to write by the Holy Spirit. Today in this message we will be making a study of the, the next three verses, that is from verse 4 to verse 6, inclusive. 
However, I wanted us to read through the whole psalm again together so that you would receive the verses we're looking at today in their proper context. Now in the first message, <coughs> I noted that this psalm has three distinct sections to it as follows, if you remember. We had number one, what we studied last time was Psalm 27, 1 to 3, verses 1 to 3, and that showed us David's confidence and faith in God. The second part, which we'll be looking at today, is Psalm 27, verses 4 to 6. And this will show us David's love for and communion with God. Next time, we'll be looking at part 3. That's Psalm 27, verses 7 to 14. And that will show us David's own understanding and the acknowledgement of the sustaining power of faith in his own life, plus the exhortation for others to follow his example. So it follows then that we'll be examining examining as I said the second section covering David's love for and communion with communion with God so let us begin and once again please uh, forgive my stumbling voice at times okay let's begin Psalm 27 verse 4 first of all let's read it through once again one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now straight away, brethren, we, we see a single-mindedness in David as he writes these words. He begins, One thing have I desired of the Lord. Now the English word desired here is the Hebrew word sha'al, sha'al. That means to inquire, to request, uh, also to demand, to obtain, to pray, to request, and so on. It means to seek by prayer or seek counsel, to inquire of the Lord. It's implied that it is something which is earnestly sought after by David. It is a, a sentiment which occurs regularly in David's writing. The desire for more of God, for a closer relationship, to dwell in God's house, etc, etc. We see this in, in many scriptures that David writes. And here are a few. First of all, Psalm 63, verse 1. Psalm 63, verse 1. A Psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. <coughs> Next we have Psalm 119, Psalm 119, two verses here, verse 44 and verse 45. Psalm 119, verse 44. So shall I keep thy law continually, for ever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. Next, Psalm 23, verse 5, one which will be, uh, verse 5 and 6, which will be well understood and well recognised by you, I'm sure. Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are some of 
the most wonderful words in scripture I think in these beautiful psalms of, of David and this earnest seeking after God was the driving desire in David's life as we shall see as we continue the study David goes on to write that that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life now you should be able to hear see and to understand that it was David's heart desire to dwell in the very presence of Almighty God in God's house. His tabernacle, the place where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt above the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. This is what David meant when he, he said next. Uh, at this point I'd like you to turn with me to the following psalm, Psalm 23. We've already spoken of two verses in this psalm, but I want us to look at the first six verses of Psalm 23 to, to get a, a feeling of what David is saying in, in our text. Psalm 23, verse 1, first of all. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. And verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beautiful, beautiful words. Let me ask you, brethren, is that your desire? Is that the, the driving force in your life that you may dwell in the house of the Lord forever this longing to be forever in the presence of his God should reflect the driving desire that ought to be in the heart of each and every born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ it was the Lord Jesus himself who had this desire for everyone who would believe upon him and the Father. See it here in his own prayer directed to his heavenly Father before he went to the cross. John 17. What a wonderful chapter this is. Jesus' priestly prayer. John 17. I'm going to read from verse 14 through to verse 26. John 17, verse 14. I, Jesus speaking here, of course. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through their word. Sorry, I'll read that again. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Verse 20, verse 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. 
I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherein thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, brethren. Our Saviour asks the Father this for us, each and every one of us. Now the close relationship promised here by Jesus is the final part of the process of the plan of God to repair the one broken and lost in the Garden of Eden. Therefore God was through David giving mankind a reminder that he was seeking for something deeper than a mere obedience to his word. He was seeking for a real relationship like that of a, a father and child. Now let me, let me ask you, is this how you would honestly describe your relationship with God at this moment? Think about it for a moment. This is God's desire for us. This was Jesus' desire and prayer for us that we may have this close relationship. This brings us to the final part of this fourth verse of our text. We haven't got to the other two yet. So the final part of this fourth verse, the first verse of our text today, David goes on to say, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, the final part of this fourth verse shows us the ultimate goal of David's heart's desire. It was to be eternally in the very presence of Almighty God. The words in English, to behold there at the beginning, are a single Hebrew word, chazah, chazah. And it means to gaze at, mentally to perceive, to contemplate with pleasure. Specifically to have a vision of, to behold, to look upon, to see. And I believe that David is here speaking of not his own physical time on earth, but rather the time after death. I'm speaking of eternity. For he knew well that no man can look upon God, or Yahweh, and live. Turn with me, if you will, now to Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verses 17 to 20. Exodus 33, verse 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. 
David knew this well. However, David here is saying that he wants to gaze on, to look, to see with his own eyes the beauty of the Lord. Now the word beauty in the English here is, by the way, is the Hebrew word noam, noam. And it means agreeableness, that is delight, suitableness, splendour or grace, beauty, pleasantness. This word noam is used twice in the following scriptures. I want to look at it for a moment. The word noam. It can be found in Zechariah verses 11 and 10. Zechariah 11 verse 7 says the following. And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, that's our word noam, and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. Now let's go to verse 10. And I took my staff, even beauty, that's our word noam, and cut it asunder, that means in two, that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. Now the word noam is used only four times as beauty. Twice here in Zechariah that we've just read. Once in our text in Psalm 27 and once in Psalm 90 verse 17. It's also used three other times in Proverbs, twice as pleasant and once as pleasantness. Now I encourage you to read all to read this whole chapter in the book of Zechariah, that's Zechariah 11, through yourselves to get the full meaning of what's being said here because we have no time to go into it here today and it is and will be the subject for an upcoming message in a future date. It will ever, however give some understanding of the beauty of which David speaks in our text today. David longs to experience the glorious magnificence of the very presence of God, which was known by Moses, both on Mount Sinai and also in the Tent of Meeting. The presence which caused his, that's Moses' face, to shine so brightly that he had to wear a veil when speaking to the people. So glorious, so powerful was the, the, the glorious image of God, the glorious presence of God on the mount and in the temple of meeting that it caused Moses' face to glow, to shine. And it scared the people. And so when Moses spoke to the people, he had to wear a veil which covered his face. Now, not only this, but David also wished to inquire in his temple. Now at this point in David's life, the, the temple as we would know it, the stone and wooden structure in uh, Jerusalem had not yet been built. Worship was done, but it was in the tabernacle, which was still in Gibeah. David wished to worship God or Yahweh and to seek the mind and heart of his God without distraction, to have a real close relationship with his creator. Surely this must be the desire of each and every one who are true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ also. We should 
desire to spend more time with God, to, to sense his beauty, to sense his glory, his magnificence, to be as close as we could possibly be to him. Surely this must be our desire today. Is it your desire today? We, of course, have an advantage that David in his day never knew. We have the advantage through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, to come into the very presence of the living God. The veil has been torn asunder. Access is free to the living God. Not just once a year, as with the high priest in the tabernacle or in the temple when it was built upon Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, but any time we wish. This is the freedom and the liberty and the openness to God, to his presence that David never knew in his physical existence on the earth. Praise God, he knows it now because he is with the Lord. But then he never knew it, but it was the desire of his heart. But this is surely what David desired in his heart when he wrote these words. So let us continue. Brethren, no wonder God said of David, this is a man after my own heart. And surely this is what God wants in his people today. Such a longing, such a desire to fellowship with him. <clears throat> I digress. So let us continue to the second verse of our text today. Psalm 27 verse 5. Let's read it together. Psalm 27 verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Praise God. It's because of all that he has previously said, that is, all that David has previously said in the previous verses, that he can now speak in complete belief that God has, to coin a phrase, got his back. It is the strong belief that must have prompted the following psalm, which was written later in David's life. Psalm 61, verses 1 to 6. I want us to read through this because it's important. Psalm 61, verses 1 to 6. Verse 1. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle for ever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou will prolong the king's life in his years as many generations. Going on to 7 and 8. He shall abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever that I may daily perform my vows. It would also inspire his son, King Solomon, who would come after him to write this well-known verse in Proverbs 18, verse 10. 
Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Praise God. Let's read that again. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that strong tower which is our God. However, let's get back to David and to our text. At the end of this verse, verse 5, David says that he shall set me upon a rock. This speaks of a, a place which is safe and that is inaccessible to his enemies. It's a place that is unshakable. You know, and it, it also reminds me of the following words of Jesus to the people of his day. Please will you turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. I'm going to read four verses from verse 46 to verse 49. Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. Verse 46 of Luke 6. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, and digged a deep, dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Please underline that part of the verse. For it was founded upon a rock. Verse 49. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Doesn't that echo the words of David about being set upon a rock? Our faith, our life, our very existence in Christ should be founded on the rock that is Christ, upon the living word. It was such faith and obedience to God and God's word which prompted Jesus to say to Peter, the following words, Matthew 16, verse 17 and 18. I'm sure all of you will know these words. Matthew 16, verses 17 to 18. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, that is Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And no, it doesn't mean that the church was founded on Peter. The Roman Catholic Church believed that, and it's false. The rock that the church will be built on was the faith. Peter expressed that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. That is the rock on which the church is built and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. The Word of God is the rock and Jesus is the living Word. The Word of God is the rock and David knew this but he did not know that God's Son, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, was and is the living Word. 
This is why the Apostle Paul could write the following verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Brothers and sisters, no man is immune from trouble, not even those whom he has called and chosen in this world. However, those whom he has called and chosen should both know and understand that there is nothing in this world that can remove us from the rock if we trust in him. I'd like you to turn with me now to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8 verses 38 and 39. Romans chapter 8 verse 38 and 39. Now as the writer of Romans rightly says, verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to read those verses once again because I want you to remember them, to remind yourself of them, and more importantly, to believe them. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Believe it, brethren, because it's true. David knew this in reality, in his life. And so should we, who are in Christ Jesus. But let us now continue with the next and final verse in our text today. <clears throat> Just three simple verses, brethren, but there's so much depth within them. We're not even scratching the surface today. The more we look at them, the more we learn. <clears throat> but let us continue and read Psalm 27, verse 6. Psalm 27, verse 6. And now, David writing, And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies, round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy i will sing yea i will sing praises unto the lord hallelujah glorious glorious words glory to the lord god almighty now david declares that because god has proved his faithfulness and love for him in his deliverance and protection amidst much affliction and trials he will therefore bring to god offerings and sacrifices of joy <clears throat> now the word joy 
that we have in our English Bibles here, well, at least in the King James anyway. The word joy is the Hebrew word teruah, teruah, which means clamour, that is, acclamation of joy or a battle cry even. The clamour of trumpets as an alarm. The blowing of trumpets the, as, as a jubilee. A loud noise, rejoicing, shouting. A high, joyful sound. That's what teruah means. It's that inner, ex, uh, outward expression of the inward joy and rejoicing. It's the same word used in the following word which is translated shout. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel, chapter 4, verse 5. 1 Samuel, chapter 4, verse 5. And I want you to look at the word shout in this verse. It's our word, teruah. <clears throat> 1 Samuel, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 5. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. Let me read it again. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout. That's our word, teruah. So that the earth rang again. What rejoicing there must have been there. What was this time? It was the time when David, who was then king, brought back the ark into Jerusalem, rejoicing as they marched. Now this kind of joy reminds me of the Apostle James's words in his epistle. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. James chapter 1. We're thinking about joy now. The offering and sacrifice of joy. James chapter 1 verse 2. <clears throat> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now the Greek word for joy here is kara, kara which means cheerfulness, that is, delight, gladness, exceeding gladness, joyfulness. This is virtually the same as the Hebrew word we saw in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 4, verse 5, isn't it? And David knew this inner joy. The Apostle James knew this inner joy. But if this were not enough, we have the following words about our very Saviour to confirm the fact. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, sorry. Verse 1, Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, hear this now, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah! Yes, 
The word joy here is our word kara, kara. Brethren, as you have hopefully seen through this brief study today, David's very heart, mind and soul longed for a close relationship with Almighty God. Not just in his life, but for all eternity. That was his longing, to be with his God forever. To be in his tabernacle, in the temple forever, and to inquire at his temple. As I said at the beginning of this message, these three verses we're looking at today sum up David's love for and communion with God. And it was obvious from uh, what we have read today that his desire was for a relationship that was closer than anything available to him in his day. Nevertheless, God loved David and through his line, God would bring his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What an honour and a privilege for this man, this simple, ordinary man who loved God. Jesus, as you will surely know, was and is the perfect example of such a relationship. And it is now through faith in Jesus' finished work at Calvary, that we who are called his disciples are given the opportunity to develop such a relationship. Yes, brothers and sisters, we have the opportunity of a relationship with Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth and all that is in them, the like of which David could only dream. This relationship is not liable to be shaken by any trial, tribulation or difficulties that may come your way in this world. That is, if you actually believe in and trust in what God has said and done already. Not only in his word, but in your life and your walk with Christ. The Apostle Paul knew the strength of this relationship and he could confidently say the following. And I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 31. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labours more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, and a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys, journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must need glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed for evermore, knoweth that I lie not. 
So, my beloved brethren, what can we say? We live in a time and in a day which on the whole is very much hostile to the message of the cross of Christ. Many on this planet live in places where any knowledge by government officials, etc., of their belief in Christ will lead there to their imminent death, or at least life sentences in torrid prisons. They still continue to believe, live and witness in obedience to their Saviour. We in the West on the whole do not live under such circumstances or conditions, at least not for now. We therefore have no excuse to be living witnesses to this lost and fallen world. If we do believe that we have an unshakable relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, then whatever challenges, whatever difficulties, whatever dangers we may face, we should, like David, like Paul, and like our Saviour himself, count it all as nothing for the joy which is set before us. We will consider the rest of this wonderful psalm the next time. So until that time I will say, may God richly bless and keep each and every one of you. In Jesus' name. Amen.